I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, go how ahead. Many, how many minutes each then? Uh, two minutes how about each or something? Eight, ten minutes. Oh. Or five. I don't have that much. Whatever. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. If you want to do five, it's fine. Okay. Oh, we have one more guest. Let me. Hi, Sanjoy. Hi. Hi, Joel. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the 2020 Zoom uh, webinar on the presidential election. This special weekly session is post-election analysis. And I am delighted to say we have uh, an all-star team of guests to analyze what happened on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday as the results uh, keep coming in. Um, I do want to uh, welcome all the students and the members of the public uh, to this webinar and remind the students who are enrolled that the second quiz closes at the end of tomorrow. So please, if you haven't taken the quiz, um, do so uh, by tomorrow. If circumstances uh, preclude you or prevent you from doing so, write me on email and I will arrange for you to take the quiz at a later date. Let me just welcome one new joining guest, Scott Siegel of IR. Great to see you, Scott. Good to see uh, you, Joel. Uh, so, uh, for the two people who joined us, uh, uh, the two guests, uh, we are going to go in order of my screen appearance, but Jason McDaniel has some slides and data, and we thought it would be good for him to present his uh, data uh, before we make comments. Let me explain to the audience the the ground rules for this round table. And it turns out to be a rectangle ta rectangular table. Um, each member of the faculty will have a certain amount of time to comment uh, on their um, thoughts about the causes for the election result. And um, what I have done is I have um, emailed almost everyone. There may be a few that um, I didn't get to email. Uh, a whole list that I came up with, and it is not intended to be exhaustive, even though it's pretty long. Uh, and then our uh, guests or members of the panel will comment on their thinking and whether it overlaps with mine. And uh, Professor uh, Jason McDaniel has some data to present regarding the election. Uh, and so we will go to him first uh, and then um, we will follow the screen order uh, for comments. And then we'll have time for questions and answer from the, um, from the uh, audience. And I will read the questions as I have done um, throughout the um, webinar. So let me just go through my list, which is intended as a conversation starter. And these are uh, variables um, that I think someone thinking about the election might offer as a causal factor uh, for the 2020 presidential election result. First, the COVID-19 pandemic surging in a number of cases, uh, in the number of cases in the second wave, right before election day and during the massive early voting mail-in period. Two, daily media counts of COVID cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Three, the Trump administration handling of the COVID-19 pandemic 
by downplaying the threat and arguing for opening up of business and schools, while Biden argued for mandatory masks and lockdown prescriptions for the pandemic virus. Four, the economy suffering since the beginning of the pandemic be began in March with tens of millions of workers unemployed and bankruptcies on the rise. Five, President Trump in public conflict with medical directors of the White House pandemic team leading to direct conflict uh, with the directors a few days before election. Six, Democrats able to change state voting regulations toward easing and extending voting by mail, strongly opposed by President Trump. Seven, the inability of Congress and the president to agree on a third stimulus relief bill for workers, businesses, and states. Eight, Biden's basement strategy and foregoing normal in-person campaigning for months because of the pandemic, while Trump held normally large rallies, especially two weeks before election day. Nine, Biden raising record amounts of cash and using it to put on the most TV and other advertisements in history against the Trump campaign that was economically forced to withdraw ads from battleground states. 10, rural exurban votes for Trump versus urban suburban votes for Biden. 11, violent summer protests over African-Americans killed by police opposed by President Trump, along with defunding the police uh, and his uh, claiming to be the law and order president while protests were downplayed by Biden. 12, increased vote for Trump by African-Americans and Latina and Latinos. 12, 13, Biden's second debate remark about transitioning from oil and gas and prior statements against fracking versus both positions opposed strongly by President Trump. 14, Biden's decency appeal against Trump's normally antagonistic and bombastic style. 15, Mainstream polls predicted big Biden, big Biden victory and Democrat, for the Democrats as a whole early in the voting period, as well as right before the election. That turned out to be questionable. 16, climate change and the differences in seriousness of threat and response by Trump versus Biden. And lastly, Big tech, social media, blocking out messages by the president uh, during the pre-election period. So those are my lists of possible causes. And now Professor uh, Jason McDaniel will show some of his data with commentary, I assume. Thank you, Joel, uh, for having me, and, and uh, thank you for everyone for being here. Um, so I have been, you know, looking for explanations since last week, um, and here's some of the things that I've come up with. Just so, you know, I'll try to go through this quickly so that I don't take up too much of the time. The first thing I would like to point out is that turnout was really high this year. Um, it looks like it's highest, uh, the voter turnout, it looks like it's going to be around 66 and a half, 66.4 percent of the voting eligible population. It, that could go higher, uh, um, uh, turned out uh, to vote in 2020. That's the highest since 1900, 1900 on record. Um, the other part of this is, if we think about then the, the, the fact that Biden got about 51 percent, you know, again, that number is slightly in fluctuation, could go a little higher of the vote. Uh, then we can see that that his share of the voting eligible population, this is what this graph compares, is the highest since um, 
1972, I said 68, Nixon. I'm having such a hard time with 68, 72, and 64 there. But basically 72 uh, under Nixon is the, is the next highest uh, and then 64 under LBJ is is the highest here. Um, you know, we're we're talking about FDR levels in some of his elections, but I think we shouldn't minimize this this uh, victory. Uh, it is not going to be that close at the end of the day, um, and it's going to represent because of the excitement and the high levels of turnout. It's going to represent quite a victory uh, in recent history, and I think that's something worth worth. Um, celebrating or at least uh, recognizing in that regard. Um, what are the causes? This graph is something that I've got, I grabbed from the internet, uh, um, so I can't speak to all the data myself. Um, the headline on it is that, you know, was trying to say that Trump picked up more support in the hardest hit COVID counties, but I actually don't think that's what's going on here. I, th I think this graph shows that COVID didn't really matter uh, to the outcome, at least broadly. Uh, and if I would love to hear from my colleagues if, if I'm misinterpreting this graph, but basically Trump improved in some uh, counties. He uh, didn't improve in others. Same thing with Biden, improved in some counties and, and, and didn't do as well in others. Uh, um, and that is, COVID had no effect <laughs> for the most part, uh, uh, you know, especially because uh, of, of, you know, looking at just, you know, deaths, if a death rate at least, um, if COVID had any effect, I think it, it was on uh, Trump's approval rating. Um, many places around the world, many leaders, many um, place, you know, leaders in the California or in the, in the United States, governors, their approval rating went up uh, because of their sort of, you know, nonpartisan emphasizing science. We've seen research showing that approval ratings go up in emergencies when leaders sort of do that sort of nonpartisan uh, 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 response pushing the experts forward. In this case, it seems that's the case for those that push forward the scientists to talk about COVID. Trump, of course, did not do this. He did not get, he got maybe a small bump of approval that seemed to have dissipated to go back to his normal level. So I don't think COVID affected the outcome, which is, I have to say, I'm, I was surprised and kind of shocked by that. That's a, that's a tentative hypothesis, but that's, that's, I think, a pretty plausible hypothesis. What did matter? This, this uh, map shows uh, um, support for the candidates. And to me, this is geographic polarization. Um, what you see here is that uh, Biden uh, Harris got very strong support in cities around the country. And in those places where uh, suburban and rural areas, but, but not just suburban areas, right? It looks to me like this election was decided in the suburbs in the Midwest, especially in Pennsylvania, where uh, um, you know, the Biden-Harris ticket did, did a little bit better than, than Hillary Clinton did in 2016. Trump did a little bit worse in some of those places. But this country is divided incredibly closely, and it's along rural and exurban communities going for Republicans, urban communities, and some of the outlying suburban communities going for the Democrats this time. But those suburban communities are swinging this a lot. And to me, it is places where the suburb, suburbs are more racially diverse, and have perhaps higher uh, education levels, more college graduates, more professional degree uh, residents. That's where we are in this country. Uh, um, and right now, if we go back to 2000, the 2000 election, and we just put Obama's elections aside, every one of them have been closed. 2000, 2004, uh, 2016, 2020, they're all really close and they could go either way um, and I think it's these perhaps these swing counties uh, um, that are going either way. It looks like the Obama elections of 2008 and 2012 are the anomalies uh, where there are clear, much more clear results. Um, Biden's, this election might be a little bit closer to 2012, right? We're going to count all the votes there. This uh, map here, uh, I got rid of it, but there's another map looking at uh, the same kind of uh, data, looking at it by geography. Uh, and again, uh, Trump seemed to have done a little bit better in some of these more rural exurban counties uh, compared to last time. Uh, Biden-Harris doing better in the su suburban areas, inner, inner ring suburbs and cities. Um, one of the things I wanted to say is political science forecast models, you know, in June and July ahead of time, they usually focus on things that are called the fundamentals. And that's usually a mix of economic forecast, economic indicators, and then how popular the president is at the time. And going into this, 
Um, the economy was sort of okay, some, somewhat at, at, during the summer. Uh, presidential approval was, was, was mixed, low 40s, mid 40s, right? And I think that explains the results. I wanna focus on something here. These were a lot of the different models and their vote for Trump. The prediction of the, the average prediction of these models is 47.8% for Trump. Well, as of today, he, his, his uh, share is 47.6% of the vote. Uh, um, and at the two party vote, I think it's gonna be a little bit higher than this. So these forecast models months ago, not based on polls before the election, right? Almost none of these include polling. A, a couple of them do, uh, but polls that were you know, months ago uh, um, did a pretty good, good job. <laughs> of, of, of forecasting the results. And so I think that can tell us that it's the economy, right? Uh, um, some, some measure of the economy and something about presidential approval ratings. Uh, I'm gonna focus on this INS and Lagodny model in a second. This, is, uh, this table is the predicted uh, economic or electoral college vote, same models, right? Um, most of them predicted Biden uh, 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 would win. And then uh, Trump's electoral college votes it's going to be about 230 something for Trump, 236 for Trump, it looks like. So again, these are pretty, pretty close. The average there, the unwitted average is pretty close. One of the things I thought was interesting is this graph. This was one of the models. This is the one by Peter Inns and Lagodny. Uh, and they used national economic indicators and then uh, state economic indicators and state approval ratings for Trump, for the, you know, for, for the presidents. And this, they, they predicted state results. And they did a pretty darn good job this time. They basically missed one state, Georgia, it looks like, uh, is the only state they missed. And they predicted a, a, a Biden win in you know, Arizona, Wisconsin, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Michigan. Uh, I think their model did a pretty good job. Uh, and again, this was months and months and months ago that they predicted this. So I think this tells us that political science still has something to say, um, which is good, I think. But that's different from the polls. And this was put together by a political scientist um, a couple of days ago, November 7th. Um, and it does look like the state level polls just, uh, there's the, the part, it's not necessarily, it looks like the average error is about six points, which is a lot, but not all states had that much of an error in the polling error. But um, this thing that scares pollsters is this is almost all in one direction. Um, the polls were under, seem to be underestimating Trump vote again, uh, just like in 2016. And it looks like to me, the best reason to explain that is that there are people out there that are distrustful of politics and society and whatever. There's lots of different kinds of people and uh, attitudes underneath that banner of distrust, but they don't enter polls. <laughs> and, they, and they disproportionately support Trump in the last two elections. Uh, um, they're just not answering polls. It's not that they're not, they're lying to pollsters. It's not that they're shy. They're just, they don't answer polls. Maybe they, you know, they, they just don't. And I saw a tweet today from, uh, from political scientists at Pennsylvania uh, that I trust. He said, um, you know, he was trying to poll Pennsylvania voters and specifically these distrustful Pennsylvania voters. And he contacted via Facebook, 10,000 uh, Pennsylvania distrustful voters got it whittled down to a thousand that he was going to send the survey to um, 48 responded and six completed the poll. <laughs> uh, only six uh, completed the poll. This is, it's just really hard. And I think there was financial inducements by the way, too. I mean, it's just, it's really hard to poll these people. So I, I'm glad I'm not a pollster, uh, but the polls are, you know, not as bad as maybe we think, but they're just, we're having problems on that right there is what I would say. Finally, and, and very quickly, it does look like um, Trump made some gains with Hispanic and Latino voters. This is data from right before the election. Um, the, the, it's academic data. This is not the polls. I don't trust the exit polls right now, but it looks like uh, uh, the, some of the polls right before the election were, were telling us that uh, uh, some of the Hispanic and Latino voters, especially by the way, uh, uh, men, Hispanic and Latino men uh, uh, were uh, um, swinging a little bit towards Trump. Frankly, I don't think that's a huge deal. I think that's just pro-incumbent, a kind of pro-incumbent thing. But, but nonetheless, uh, um, it looks like Trump got back to the sort of George Bush level, perhaps with, with uh, Latino voters around 25 to 30%. We're gonna have to 
decide that as we go forward. Some similar numbers with African-American voters. These are not polls, uh, but uh, from a political scientist at Stanford who studies Black American voters and showing some of the diversity of their views uh, in terms of liberal, conservative, moderate. Um, so I think we need to be careful about these num the, 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 this, this conclusion, but there is some evidence in some places that uh, Hispanic Latino voters of various ethnic national origins maybe swung a little bit towards Trump, maybe a lot in some places like Miami, and we're going to have to keep investigating that. Um, and so, you know, I don't think it's COVID. I think it's the economy helped explain the closeness. I think the economy was better for a lot of Trump voters than I think we, we perhaps perceived. Um, and I think they voted with that. I think his popularity was strong amongst a lot of his supporters, but it was not enough to win. Um, high turnout on both sides did not advantage one party or the other, but maybe it was enough in terms of the mail voting in some states to get really high levels of turnout, um, which might have might have advantaged you know Biden Harris there, but I think right now it's just really high turnout on both sides, um, and it's the economy and it was Trump's unpopularity, since that has basically been that way for four years and that's it, we're a polarized nation. That's that's sort of my conclusion. Uh, um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jason, for bringing that data to us which I think is fascinating. Uh, we have a new uh, panel member. Let me uh, just make him a co-host. Welcome, Marty. Um, we'll go in the order uh, of my screen. Marcella, your first uh, reaction um, and maybe reaction to Jason's data. Yeah, uh, thank you for presenting. Um a really fascinating picture of what happened. I think one of the things um, when I was thinking about what could have possibly happened or what happened is that a couple of things um, you point to is this is record turnout, uh, but we we saw in 2016 essentially 3 million more votes for the Democrat uh, and it was an electoral college loss, right? And this time we saw five to 6 million more votes for the Democrat and that put us over the edge, quote unquote, um, or put the Democrat over the edge. And so one of the things that I um, that I keep thinking about is that it was essentially a what world are you living in question. Uh, and so there's a disconnect between what people live and what they believe. And I think that the, the, the point that you made about COVID didn't matter. I, I think it didn't matter for the battleground states. I think it mattered for the Democrats uh, and the 210,000 uh, people who and families of people who have died. And so I think uh, the fact that it hit Democratic strongholds first uh, colored the reception among uh, Republican uh, states and Republican populations. And so I think that they didn't see it as an issue. And in fact, when they uh, in a lot of the polling on election day, Republicans cited the economy as the strongest issue. And more people were buffered um, or protected or insulated from the effects of the, of the shutdown because of the $1,200 check in April, May, and because of the $600 supplement um, that went through July that most people saved uh, because of the anticipated extended shutdown. And so it's not hitting yet. The evictions are still uh, on pause, people are still sort of getting some of that money, some of that unemployment money. So I think it ended up being a what world are you living in question is, is were you directly affected by COVID? Was it not just health related, but also mentally and financially um, a burden? And then, um, and if it wasn't, then you were voting on an economy that was inflated by the, the by the stimulus, right? And so you weren't evaluating it um, on its uh, on its face. I do have one thing to say on the Latino vote. Uh, it was a three point increase for Latino men and women equally. Um, women over their 2016 um, vote, he did not exceed the max, which is about 40% uh, for George uh, W. Uh, Bush, and I believe in 2000 or 2004. Um, but he pushed 35. 35 is not a small amount, um, but it went up uh, 
for white women for 55%. Um, they went up to 55% this election. Uh, black women went up 4% and black men went up 4% from 2016. So this is not, um, there, there is some conversation to be had about how race intersects here because uh, it decreased for white men in some amount. And so um, I, we can have that conversation later since I've, I've taken up more than my two minutes, but I do want to have that conversation at some point. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Francis Neely of the department, I should mention um, the department since we have a couple of members from IR and not just political science. Francis Neely of political science. Hi, hi to all my colleagues, everyone who's um, in the uh, class. Thanks, Joel, for heading this up. I appreciate it. Um, I guess I'm going to take a little side street here uh, and just confess that I'm, I'm really uh, seeking therapy right now. And so it's useful to hear my colleagues, uh, you know, talk in an informed way about this. Mm -hmm. It's useful just to bounce this off of my kids and with my partner and, and try to make sense of it. But um, I'm traumatized and I think uh, we all are. It's worse than the pandemic. I mean, that is a crisis. We're in the midst of it. it. It's as bad as it's been. And now for how many months running? But it's also um, a president who's um, disrespectful and purposefully and <laughs> blatantly, uh, you know, anti-institutional and, and um, shreds the norms, the mores, the customs of um, of our government and its practices. And so trying to make sense of a, as a political scientist, but also just as a person trying to make sense of what's happened uh, over these past months and last week, um, it's, um, it's a bit beyond me. I'm, 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 I'm too messed up right now. But um, since I'm trained and I can offer <laughs> some information from that training, I'll, I'll do my best to do that. Uh, first, I want to make the point that we should be careful not to accept the false narrative that this was an ex a, a, a especially close race because it took four days to decide. Pennsylvania was known Thursday morning. The media, main media organization should have announced it then. It would have been a different perception altogether about the closeness of the race. Um, and, and it's not that close. I think. Uh, Biden's going to have 306, the same amount as Trump did uh, four years ago, plus the popular vote. Um, also, um, speaking of emotions, uh, I, I study political psychology, and so the, um, the cognitive psychology literature has something to say about what's going on in our country. And um, we process almost all information without giving it conscious consideration. When I say almost all, I mean 99%. We're operating from uh, automatic processes in, in our brains uh, at the basic part of the brain, in the amygdala where we've evolved to make quick decisions because we don't have time. The people who stopped to think things through were the dead ones that didn't re uh, procreate, right? So anyway, um, there's a literature on emotions and decision-making and it's the case that people who are angry in an angry state uh, are more likely to, to, to act harsh, uh, harshly or brashly, I mean, and, and, uh, and accept risk. Um, and it's the case that people who are in an anxious state in, uh, driven by fear and anxiety are more likely to stop and pause. And that's when we actually take the time to use the prefrontal cortex and, and think what we call you know, reason. Um, I think if you just look at mask wearing, there's some people who are angry and take a risky choice. And then if there are people who are anxious and fearful and make a more considered choice. And that filters out to all sorts of political behavior more than just mask wearing. So there's that. Um, the polls, uh, as Professor McDaniel noted, the projections, actually all of the people, the aggregators and others who, who use the polling data to make projections, the projections were fairly spot on. The polling stunk and it's, and it's uh, flawed. And so those who are trying to make sense of that right now, it'll take a while to do that. Uh, today and yesterday, a popular 
uh, theory on this is that things have changed and the people who are distrustful aren't in the samples because they, they don't get included in the samples because they won't co cooperate. I'm not sure about that. The, that requires us to accept that around 2012 or 2016, everything changed. And I, I've been around since before 2012, 2016 and interested in polling. And, you know, there were people distrustful then. And I'm not sure there was a qualitative shift that supports that theory, but it might be. Um, another thing about the election, I'm just kind of going off different points, but another thing about the election is that you'll hear, oh, let me say about the polling. It's not the case that as, as some Democrats, or I'm sorry, as some Republicans are promoting that the Democrats purposefully ramped up the polls to hurt the Republicans' chance to, to make them disinterested. That's simply not the case. That's baloney. Um, and it's also not the case that because Biden didn't, his coattails didn't sweep in a, a net gain in the House of Representatives that the Democrats failed. Um, over the, since Eisenhower, the, the years where there were positive versus negative coattails are about equal. So that's not that unusual. I'm glad that Donald Trump's uh, voted out. Um, I'm really completely bothered, and this is where I flip over to my feelings, that he had the support he did in this, in this election and that he has the support of Republican establishment right now denying the results of the election. Um, finally, uh, I'll probably be a minority voice here on this last point that's separate from the others, really. It is true that we're divided, but, you know, my friend out in exurban Sonora, and if you know California, you know that's the boonies, um, and my relatives in Aberdeen, South Dakota, and in Elkhart, Indiana, who are all Republicans and Trump voters, and I and, and us, we have a lot in common. The, the biggest chunk of what we, the ethos, the, the political ethos that we accept is in common. And when you look at public opinion of the people, not the leaders, not the party organizations, um, this is more evident. And so I know we're operating on an us them, you know, uh, dynamic, but I just, every, election year and every every time we talk about this stuff, I, I bring this up and repeat that we have a lot more in common with the quote other side than gets airplay. And so I keep reminding myself of that. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Francis, especially that last point, which about what we have in common will be important as we move forward uh, in the future. Um, Sanjoy Banerjee, Professor of International Relations, your comments uh, about the causal factors of the results of 2020. Yeah, I actually want to talk about two different issues. One is the election, how it turned out and why it turned out. But I also would like to talk a little bit about events since the election. Uh, they may end up not mattering, and a few months from now, we'll just revert to the normal uh, way of thinking about elections. Um, th yes, th there was much higher overall turnout. Um, um, one could describe it as a voting riot, that sort of competitive voting, which is how voting is supposed to work. Um, But uh, uh, it should also be noted that it was deliberately made inconvenient for certain people to vote. Uh, there were voter suppression efforts, as there were four years ago. Four years ago, those efforts were basically successful. They depressed not a huge amount of the vote, but uh, certainly estimates I saw at the time suggest that the number of votes uh, depressed in swing states by voter suppression efforts was larger as large as Trump's margin of victory in those states. Um, this time, uh, uh, you know, Stacey Abrams, who I, I think, uh, you know, is starting to be recognized as a hero, uh, as a hero uh, of democracy or a heroine of democracy, um, 
and uh, and it genuinely is that. I mean, uh, in Georgia, turning Georgia blue is sort of mind-boggling. Um, but uh, you know, the same thing happened in in, in the other swing states also. Uh, so one must recognize that there was this new steely determination on the part of voters that they would wait in line for hours. And only, only some voters in some locations had, had to do that and others voted very easily. But um, so, th so there was this social movement, which at some level the social movement is always there. Okay, I mean, every four years, you see television ads saying to vote, you see celebrities encouraging people to vote, and the end result is sort of the same. This time, as I understand it, even youth turned out. Uh, uh, they're notor notorious malingerers and, uh, when it comes to voting. And uh, even, even youth turnout was better. Um, so, I mean, one of the things which we saw was a kind of popular cultural mobilization, which took place over the entire four years. And um, I, I'm not sure, you know, if, if it was because, uh, you know, television comedians all said the same thing, um, or that people sort of felt the pain more directly uh, and, and mobilized, but there was this clear mobilization process amongst segments of society, minorities and perhaps youth, who were not previously mobilized. Uh, even if four years early. Um, now, uh, was having Biden as opposed to say, um, Senator Elizabeth Warren, uh, the candidate, did that make a difference? Uh, Biden outpolled Democratic House candidates in Pennsylvania. Um, uh, so that is probably the best single reason to say, yes, that was a good choice. Um, but let me um, switch to um, a topic which, um, I, you know, one doesn't know what to make of it at this point. Yes, Trump has not uh, made a concession speech. That, that in itself is, is not a big deal. Um, and, you know, he's challenging the election results in courts. That also, I think, is not a big deal. Um, there was some fear, there has been some fear, maybe there still is, that the Supreme Court will be willing to play games, um, maybe, but uh, it's worth noting that um, in today's newspaper, uh, they were saying that um, Obamacare is, uh, its fate in the Supreme Court sounds a little better than, than what people feared. But the point is, if, if uh, the conservative court is willing to let Obamacare survive, then I think completely overthrowing the Constitution is a is a further step that they, they would not be willing to take. Um, and it, it's against their institutional interest to take it. I mean, this is Madison's genius that um, uh, if uh, if there is some kind of a dictatorship, then the Supreme Court doesn't matter that much. Um, but uh, on the downside, um, of course, uh, the Secretary of Defense, Mike Esper, was fired, which in itself is not a big deal. Uh, it's just a the sort of personal thing that Trump does. But since then, uh, in the about in the last 24 hours, uh, I believe four positions underneath him have been changed by Trump loyalists. Uh, his chief of staff, uh, a couple of undersecretaries of defense, uh, and so on. Um, that is not uh, about Mike Esper saying that he doesn't want to uh, military to be used in, in, in civilian policing. That, is, uh, that seems to have a different direction. Now, it is also not enough, not nearly enough. Civilians in the Pentagon ultimately cannot do the trick. Um, it would require replacement of uh, top military officers um, and um, uh, you know, I'm not sure how that game would be played. Uh, I'm sure the military officers in question, uh, uh, you know, they think about uh, the scenario uh, of uh, a military coup or a militarized coup uh, about, about the same as those of us on this call do, on this Zoom do. Um, but, um, uh, you know, what, he can replace uh, General Miley, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He, he has a 
legal constitutional authority to do all that. So uh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's the next shoe to fall. And um, uh, if it falls, I think it's fairly bad news. Uh, if it doesn't fall, if uh, he has not messed with the military four years ago, uh, the day after the election, I was really afraid that he would mess with the military and then use it in uh, a non-democratic ways. That, that did not happen at all. So I, you know, I want to uh, express all my paranoia and my fears uh, while acknowledging that, uh, you know, I, I was drastically wrong. The last four years have not been nearly as bad as what I feared the morning of the election. Maybe a shocking thing to say, but it's true. All right, that's it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sanjoy. Um, our next speaker is Professor Ron Hayduk of the Department of Political Science. Hi, colleagues. It's lovely to see you today. Thank you so much, Joel, for having me. Um, sure. This is a really vibrant conversation. I um, I. I want to also acknowledge that the bigger turnout is significant. That's very uh, heartening. I think that's something that um, democracy advocates would be wanting to celebrate and elevate. Um, and uh, you know, 66% of the voting eligible population, highest since 1900. That's that's not to be dismissed. Um, but you know, there's like uh, 80 million eligible folks who did not vote in one of the most uh, significant elections of people's lifetime, it was billed as, right? So what does that tell you? And who are those non-voters? They're not a random sample of the population. They are disproportionately low income, minority, younger, less educated folks who are, you know, ripe for the pickings for either party, but uh, tend to, um, lean, uh, at least according to the voters, more democratic. So I think there's some lessons there uh, to take away. Um, Jason's point about geographic polarization, very important. Um, I think you can also maybe more properly frame it as a racial polarization because the cities and suburbs are way more diverse than the rural and exurban portions of the population of the geography in the United States, right? So, I mean, 40% of all African Americans live in the suburbs now. So, um, so I think that we have to think about that. And um, it's true, while some higher proportion of Blacks and Latinos uh, voted for Trump this year, as opposed to 2016, compared to 2016, especially. Cuban Americans and other refugees, better off refugees from Latin America, um, Latino men, African American men, Asian American men, and evangelicals. Um, I think one can uh, one needs to highlight the fact that um, Biden won in these states, very close margins. <laughs> We've all been sort of watching, um, largely because those are the places where. It was, in fact, bigger turnout by um, African Americans in Milwaukee, in Detroit, in Georgia, in Latinos, in Arizona, in Nevada, and suburbans broke for Biden. Um, right. So, like, I just think that that racial composite, the the, po the parties have become more racially polarized, and I think that's something that has been happening for some time, and. Um, it's worth uh, exploring. Um, you know, you could always say there's maybe an emerging brown belt, um, a voting block developing in the Southwest that includes Arizona, Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, maybe Texas. Um, and so there's lessons, I think, in terms of how the parties might uh, look at these voters. The real underperformers in some ways were white voters um, who actually dropped their proportion of the electorate from 71% in 2016 to 65% of the voting electorate this year. Um, and this is especially true, well, we have to talk about gender and age and class. Okay, so I think you can also think of not just like a, there's less of a gender gap in some ways than a racial gender gap, right? Because as our colleague, uh, Marcella Jane Jun 
uh, has told us, right? Why women um, voted at higher percentages for Trump this year than in 2016. And whites have not voted for a democratic candidate as a group since 1964. <laughs> and white women have been uh, a big chunk of that. So I think we have to think about these things um, as, as gendered and racialized. In terms of income, um, in 2016, Trump lost to those who earned under $50,000 by roughly 10 points. This year, he lost by 15 points by those making under $50,000. I know, Jason, there's some problems with the exit polls, but this is what the numbers say right now. Um, and in 2016, those that earned $50,000 to $100,000 favored Trump by four points. This year, they flipped to uh, Biden by a 13 point advantage. Right, so, and, and here's a, an example to think about Florida, right, which delivered um, the state to Trump, but the voters by 61% voted to pass the $15 an hour minimum wage, right? So we have to think, and you know, Biden sort of soft peddled the policy even though he supported it, right? I think this is some lessons for the uh, Democrats is, you know, you have to speak to your base and I think that's something that um, is a takeaway. Another takeaway is there were few Biden Republicans. Um, the strategy to appeal to the Republicans seems to have failed. The Lincoln Project seems to have failed. In 2016, 90% of those that voted, voted for Trump, uh, of Republicans, 90% of Republicans voted for Trump in 2016. This year, 93% of Republicans voted for Trump. So appealing to Republicans does not seem to have been a, a productive strategy for the Democrats. Um, so I think there's lessons, uh, both in terms of electoral thinking for 2022, which is gonna come so fast, my head's gonna spin, then um, 2024, but also for governing. I think there's some important lessons for governing for the Democrats. Um, you know, uh, they would be wise perhaps to uh, govern in ways to really play to their base. Uh, and thereby draw in um, those potential non-voters who would be potential allies, natural allies. Um, and, uh, you know, concrete things, health care, which is quite popular, you know, rent relief, uh, unemployment uh, assistance, farm assistance, infrastructure, broadband, you know, green jobs, democratic reforms. And if McConnell and the and company sort of block it, lay it at their feet. You got to really make this uh, clear to the base, I think. Um, there's a, a slogan I always like, uh, don't mourn, organize. And the organizing that actually happened by a lot of community groups and unions uh, year round, um, aside from this last bunch of months, really did uh, help generate turnout in these key places for the Democrats. And I think um, this is really something that about uh, organizing we need to um, invest in the Democrats and we, the people, I, I kind of, I couldn't agree more with Francis that there's a lot more um, people on different sides of the aisle, voters have in common with each other. Um, you know, what do they call them? Kitchen table issues. <laughs> um, and I think that those kitchen table issues are things that the, uh, the Democrats can and should lead with. Um, and they should set up offices of civic engagement that you know, work year round to engage people in the process, uh, not just during elections. And um, you know, maybe make public policy making more participatory, uh, expand and scale up participatory budgeting, for example, or other means by which you can uh, engage people in meaningful ways uh, than you know, just every few years at election time. So there's more lessons I think we can take, but. Um, I'm going to shut up and let my colleagues talk. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot for those insights, Ron. Rebecca Eisler is a member of the Department of Political Science. Rebecca, your thoughts. Well, I, I just want to say I feel honored to be following so many of my colleagues, and they hit on a lot of the points that I've been thinking about. But, you know, trying to make some, some contributions, building on themes that we've been talking about. We've talked about... Um, geographic polarization, we've talked about racial polarization. I think it's important to talk about how this election is, 
is just very strong evidence of party polarization. So, you know, we saw over the last 70 years where the trend started with folks in Congress uh, polarizing towards the, the parties and becoming more extreme. Um, empirically, we've seen that Republican members of Congress are more extreme on the ideological spectrum than their Democrats are, but, but there's been a weeding out of the center um, on both for both parties. And we've seen this trend trickle down into the public as well, that we're seeing this polarization amongst the public. And I think that is very strongly evident in this election. We've, we've heard this in various facts and figures that we've talked about so far, but you know, just, I think it was, it was Ron who mentioned this, that if 93 or 96% of people who voted for Trump last time voted for Trump this time. I mean, that could be something about Trump himself as a candidate, but I think it, it in part of it is reflecting that I am, that, that identification that voters have with the party and it, how strong that if you have an identification with a party, then you hold that very strongly as opposed to a belief that you hold more weakly and thus might be more willing to cross party lines. Um, but at the same time, we also at the congressional level have seen what seems like more split ticket voting where you vote for a president of one party and a member of Congress of another, then at least to my knowledge of, of last few cycles of election returns than we have. So that's sort of an interesting puzzle of, of what maybe, you know, this would be investigated as we go forward, um, what maybe prompted an increase um, in this willingness to split ticket vote. Um, so that will be a really interesting question for us to consider. Um, in terms of COVID, I, I agree completely that my reading of the data is that in terms of vote choice, so whether you voted for um, Joe Biden or for Donald Trump, COVID didn't affect that decision, but it definitely affected a lot of the decision making that people did around how they were going to vote and how they were communicated with about voting. So we saw a lot of messaging in the spring and summer um, by Democratic organizers saying we, we vote by mail, vote by mail, vote by mail. And that, and, and at the same time, we were hearing from President Trump, don't trust vote by mail. So there was this polarization in method of voting, which I think contributed to the delayed knowledge of, of the outcome of the election because certain states made it easier, maybe made it easier to vote by mail, but then did not make it easier to count those votes. Um, but it, it really, I think that reaction then caused Democrats to change their messaging towards the end of the campaign towards, if you can do it safely, go vote in public to try to counteract the messaging on the Republican side. So I think we we maybe can discount or, or we'd have to look more deeply into it of whether COVID affected vote choice. I don't think it did, but I live to be surprised, but I think it definitely affected voting method and thus experience with different voting methods. What you learn in one election cycle from going to vote early or filling out a mail ballot is knowledge that people now have for future elections. And I think that's an important dynamic to keep in mind as we move forward, that there could be lessons or effects of this election cycle uh, administratively that linger much longer. People who've only ever voted in person, a lot of them now just got a crash course in voting by mail. Um, the other thing, and this is, uh, I think, maybe not got quite as much empirical evidence as yet, but it's a hypothesis that I want to sort of put forward for us to be thinking about, is I think we may have just seen some evidence of how important door knocking. So having people come to your door and talk to you about candidates, because before there may be differences in the, the absolute size and amount of door knocking on each partisan side that occurred, but there was 
efforts on both sides for roughly the same lengths of time and the same intensities. Well, we've now just had an election cycle where one party continued its activities as normal, almost as normal, and the other party did not, did not engage in, they, they chose to do more digital organizing. And we might be able to attribute some of the strength of the Republican party turnout because there was more face-to-face -face engagement with voters. Um, so I think that's a, a really interesting um, sort of natural experiment um, that we, we're going to want to maybe dive into a little bit more deeply. Maybe we, we actually know the effect of a campaign action. Most of the time, it's hard to, for political scientists to know how much of an effect a certain type of action um, actually makes on the outcome because no one doesn't do it. Everyone does everything, and so you can't untangle necessarily all the effects. But here we've got um, a time where we do have a contrast between the two parties. So um, those are my main points. I, I'm really interested to following on what Sanjay was saying to see what happens through the rest of this transition period. I fundamentally, I'm a scholar of what presidents do in office. So I'm really um, interested to how we get to the next president in office. And with that, I'll hand it over. Okay. Um, I just want to interject, um, since you emphasize party mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to candidates, one of the issues that I follow closely is climate change. And I have seen polls that show upwards of 80% of Republican identifiers downplay the significance of climate change. And if we are going to get different public policy that we need, someone is going to have to talk to those Republican identifiers on that issue. Um, and that shows the power of party uh, independent of, of particular candidates in specific elections. Scott Siegel is a member of the Department of IR. And Scott, if you hit share screen, as a co-host, you will be able to show your slides. Sorry, I'm muting myself. You think I'd be an expert at all this Zooming uh, by now. Uh, but let me just uh, take off my slides and... Um, so thank you very much, Joel, for letting me participate uh, in this uh, panel. And I actually am glad I'm on this panel rather than last week's panel, because um, I think it's good to take a breath uh, after, um, after this last week and let your mind rest and calm down, get the therapy you need, Francis, and relax. <laughs> but Francis, I have to disappoint you that um, what I'm about to say is not going to make you any happier. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad to be on this panel because I come from the point of view of an IR and comparativist perspective. And some of the things I'll say kind of piggyback on what um, Sandra has said, but I'm also gonna say a few things um, about uh, the Republican party and the state of, um, of, of American democracy. And so on, on my first slide here, you can see uh, a tweet that went around. I love academic Twitter. It's like my favorite thing. By the way, follow SF State IR to hear about all the great things that the IR department is doing. That's at SF State IR. So uh, this went around uh, the interwebs. And you can see, if you can't read it, it says, around the department, Americanists, how bad can it really be? Or how can it be really? How bad can it be really? Comparativists, uh, it could lead to dictatorship and purges. International relations scholars, nuclear war. And then uh, Americanists generally, like you see on this panel a little bit, <laughs> ha ha ha, but seriously, how bad could it get? IR and comparative is who is joking, okay? And then the theorists uh, are coming in and saying, hey, you guys should have been talking to us the whole time. And what are they talking about? They're talking about how dangerous is the situation we are in now and why did it lead to that point? 
And my point would be that if we look at um, American politics and the American election in the comparative NIR perspective, we're in deep doo-doo. So um, why do I think we're in deep doo-doo? The first thing I want to do is piggyback on what uh, Sandro was saying about the transition period. So President Trump has not accepted uh, the results of the election, you know, from a normative standpoint. Um, of course, legally, you know, no election has even happened. I mean, there hasn't been this certification of the election results yet. But neither have many members of the U.S. Senate and Republicans, and there's all kinds of uh, uproar going on such that conspiracy theories are being spread uh, around the internet and around American society and within the Republican Party. And whether the Republican Party actually believes this stuff um, or, or whether it's all engineered to keep the base happy or to keep Trump happy doesn't really matter to me. What really what it has done is at least uh, three things. First, um, the lack of uh, acknowledgement of the election and the winner and Biden winning is a security risk. Um, clearly, there is not going to be a clear, uh, transparent, and smooth transfer of information, especially on security issues, uh, top secret security elements, um, to the uh, Biden administration so far. And I was reading the 9-11 report a little while ago, and it cited that one reason we missed 9-11 is because a lot of information about the power of Al-Qaeda and willingness to attack uh, us uh, was missed by Bush administration officials who didn't show up uh, into their offices um, until days, 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 weeks after uh, the election. So uh, the 9-11 report cited the delayed transition in 2001 as one reason why 9-11 uh, was missed. The second, um, uh, from an IR perspective, is that our adversaries are clearly strengthened by what's going on at the moment, not by the results of the election, but what's going on right now. Russia, China, and others are quite happy to see America's dysfunctionality uh, at play. The fact that Russia and China have, neither of them have congratulated Biden on the election is pretty amazing, uh, especially by the Chinese, who um, clearly would like to have some stability between the US and, um, and, and themselves in terms of economic issues. Yes, they're a little bit more uh, concerned about a, a Biden presidency than a Trump presidency because they, the Chinese have been able to get away with much, much more uh, than probably a Biden administration will let them. And so the Chinese are probably uh, holding fire to find out what's happened. But it's in general though, anyone, any leader out there, Erdogan in Turkey, uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, all uh, anti-democratic right-wing populist leaders are all being strengthened and those leaders who are uh, democratically elected and believe in democratic norms are somewhat weakened. Um, and the Europeans, uh, we can talk about maybe later, but the Europeans of course are relieved that uh, Biden won. And, uh, but yet the, given the results, they're probably wondering exactly uh, what is going on in American society and how split it is. And so our credibility as a country, as a supporter of democratic institutions has been, is, and will be substantially weakened by what's going on right now. Now, let me switch over to a little bit of a, of a comparative uh, perspective on the election. And that's talking about the Republican party. And where does the Republican party lie uh, in a, on the left right spectrum compared to other parties in the world? And I think, that's, we kind of missed the forest uh, for the trees, if I get that metaphor phrasing right, is that we really should look at the Republican Party and American politics now in a comparative perspective. Americanists, and no offense to all my colleagues who I love so much in the political science department, but it's really important that we start looking at how the same uh, aspects that shape right-wing populism and even far-right uh, nationalism in Europe also shape American politics and the causes of decline. So none of the things I'm going to say are necessarily original. They're uh, all listed in a book called How Democracies Die, which is like a giant bestseller now for two political scientists. And um, if I could, for all of these, all of you watching, get a copy of How Democracies Die and see how well we follow uh, that, um, that game plan. 
So what you see here is uh, the ideological orientation of uh, right wing of parties of all kinds of political parties in advanced industrialized states, OECD states, so rich countries. And there are two dimensions here. One dimension that goes horizontal is to what extent you um, uh, you favor redistribution, you favor redistribution in, in the economy. Um, and then, uh, no, no, sorry, on, is a, you respect or undermines liberal democratic principles, norms, and practices. And on the vertical axis is the party favors or opposes ethnic minority rights. Okay, so again, on the horizontal axis is that does the party respect or undermine liberal democratic principles, norms, and practices? And on the left, uh, on the vertical axis is do they favor or oppose ethnic minority rights? And what you see here um, is the uh, Republican Party, the GOP, and the Democratic Party uh, highlighted in red. Okay, so the GOP now, for all effective purposes, and and I think colleagues smarter than me and and more renowned than me, uh, generally conclude that uh, the GOP is a right wing populist, if not becoming a right wing nationalist party. If you look at what's going on right now. It looks like one of the main political parties and the largest political party in the United States does not accept democratic norms and procedures. Okay, and, and I'm not trying to be alarmist, but if you compare it to the past and other parties currently in Europe, it's, it's becoming increasingly clear that the Republican party doesn't accept majority rule or, um, or abiding by democratic norms with based on what's going on. So, um, and compare that to the Democrats who are relatively centrist still on a lot of these issues of abiding by liberal democratic norms and generally um, favoring uh, minority rights. So in general, the GOP has become this uh, right wing nationalist party. And what makes you different from a populist party is whether you accept the existence of democracy or not. Most right-wing populist parties would accept uh, the institutions of democracy, nationalists uh, don't. So who votes for right-wing populist slash nationalist parties? Well, um, as kind of intimated by the panel here so far is that basically middle-class dominant social group people vote for them. And in the United States, that's white. So white middle-class people who would benefit from the policy status quo who distrust elites and distrust government vote for them, okay? When you have policies that a majority of them like, um, economic policies that, ev that will benefit everyone, then they'll vote for them. And that explains Florida, right? So it shouldn't be so puzzling why uh, the minimum wage was increased uh, uh, in Florida by plebiscite, because that's gonna benefit everybody. But if you have middle class white people thinking that they're going to be harmed as the result of the expansion of democracy, then they'll vote for uh, right wing uh, populist uh, parties. So um, it's dangerous. And here's where uh, we could end up. And I'm not trying to be alarmist. I'm like Mr. Null hypothesis. I'm, I'm like everything will be fine and nothing will really change. But if you read uh, how democracies die, you know, this week should get you more concerned, especially with what Pompeo is and is not saying, um, whether he's laughing about a second Trump administration, I don't know. But first of all, right wing populist parties really succeed when the mainstream conservative party welcomes them in. And what does that mean for American politics? What that means is that quote, mainstream Republicans, business friendly Republicans refuse to condemn Trump, okay? And some of them are, are deeply on his side. And there are, there are exceptions kind of, like Romney and, and, and Susan Collins kind of, sort of, but you know, they'll send out a tweet, but that's not what you need. In Europe, the right-wing populist parties uh, do not become a danger when they're excluded from government. Okay, and I can talk later about, about when right-wing populist parties enter government or later or some other day. But um, so 
So that's a big, big problem. As long as Trump is continually coddled as of we speak, uh, the chances of slipping down into a hole that we don't want to go down to is that a democracy get greater. And then I know Sandro agree with me that as an IR scholar and understanding nukes, that the longer you stay on a road that's leading to danger, the harder it is to get off it, right? So it's harder and harder to convince yourself to get off the road, to, to swerve. And that's where we are right now. The road is going further. We're going downhill faster is probably what I would say. The informal norms of governance are breaking down and we've had them break down for the last four years. Um, so everything that's happened this week and then uh, the appointment of Barrett to the Supreme Court um, the losers are not acknowledging democratic procedures are legitimate. So one of the best things I learned from graduate school, I don't know if I learned much, but one thing I learned was that democracies are all about certain procedures leading to uncertain outcomes and uh, dictatorships are about uncertain procedures leading to certain outcomes. You know, meaning the democracies, you don't know really what's going to happen after the sausage is made, but you know how the machine works. And in uh, dictatorships, you have no idea what the um, uh, procedure is, but you know it's gonna benefit the dictator in the end. Um, so right now the problem is, is no one's recognizing the procedures and the Republican party seems to really want to uh, just do whatever's in the benefit of them and their, um, and their leader, uh, Donald Trump. Uh, we're in a process in which legal methods are being used to reach undemocratic outcomes. Uh, I learned a new word today, autogolpe, which apparently is uh, using legal methods to stage a coup. Um, uh, that was kind of cool. Um, Right-wing ideological party is not accepting majority rule and wishes to retain it. Our institutions in the United States are not democratic. There are, you know, Wisconsin is effectively not a democracy any longer. Um, and, and other states uh, with extreme gerrymandering are not democracies. Um, and then there's a spreading of conspiracy theories that leads to more delegitimization and inability to government. I have a lot more to say about, um, about uh, the polling and stuff like that, but I think that's already been covered. So I'm not gonna go on that round. I just wanna end with one positive note and that we have a record number of LGBTQ uh, representatives elected uh, around the country. Um, we now have a state Senator that's transgender that's the highest ranking official for a member of the LGBTQ community. We have two gay, gay black men that are entering uh, Congress. Um, we have uh, New Mexico, the entire congressional de de delegation is Native American, by the way. Um, and of course, uh, Kamala Harris, um, Kamala Harris as, um, as, the, as the vice president elect is an amazing uh, achievement. Uh, and even at the local level, we now have for the first time an openly bi, uh, bisexual uh, minority on the South San Francisco City Council, uh, who happens to be a biologist from Harvard. So I don't know how that happened. Uh, maybe we need more biologists. But anyway, um, that's just to say, like, as bad as I made this picture sound, there's still a lot of good things, you know, going on. Uh, with the election of LGBT um, um, represent members of the LGBT community to office, and and yes, uh, our first um, uh, black uh, vice president, women of color, so on and so forth. But um, I don't. Tr I'm not trying to make Francis more worried uh, than he already is. And I know Francis. It's emotional for you. It's emotional for all of us. Um, and, and I didn't help, so I'm sorry. <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks a lot, Scott, for trying to bring truth uh, to the group, whether it makes us feel better or not. Uh, I think the premise of seeking knowledge is that eventually truth will help, even if it doesn't initially but at least if you can make adjustments based on the truth, uh, the end of the story might turn out to be happier. On that note, let me turn to Professor Martin Carcieri of the Political Science Department. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my, uh, and I appreciate Aaron holding back there for a second. I sent uh, 
a note to uh, Joel. I, think my, I have to leave five minutes ago, so. Oh, you sorry. Yeah. yeah, it's all right. It's all right. Let me say a couple things here. Um, first of all, uh, to, to respond a little bit to some of my colleagues' uh, comments, I'd like to underscore in response to my friend uh, Jason. Left and liberal are not synonyms. <laughs> As a political theorist, I have to say that. Liberalism, I think we know, is a centrist position. Um, there's a range of liberal positions, but it is not the hard left any more than it's the hard right. So I feel like I always have to say that as a liberal because it causes so much confusion. There's a lot of people who basically think left, hard left and liberal are the same thing, and they are not. So I'll leave that there. Uh, I want to underscore uh, also uh, with the point that Francis and Ron both made that uh, we have more in common than uh, separates us. I think that's always important to to uh, keep in mind because so often we seem to focus on uh, what's so different uh, about us and uh, I think uh, to our detriment. And uh, Sanjoy used the term notorious malingerers. I just love that, you know, this is what smart people because they come up with stuff like that, you see? So, uh, all right. Anyway, that all said, uh, let me just say, first of all, thank God Biden won. <laughs> thank God for that. Um, obviously, the jury is still out on the Senate. We're going to find out about that. And if uh, Republicans keep the Senate, needless to say, that's going to uh, you know, really slow down some of what uh, Biden and uh, Democrats would like to do. Um, so we've got that. That said, you know, I think uh, Republicans, conservatives, in a way, have gotten as much out of Trump as they could have hoped for. The tax cut which may get reversed, depending, but three young, smart conservatives on the U.S. Supreme Court. That's big. That's big. That's going to, and we're going to be living with that for a long time, probably. Uh, Alito and uh, Thomas are the two oldest members of the Supreme Court. They're both in their early 70s. You know, I don't know how long they'll be there. We don't know how long anybody's going to be there, but it may well be that Trump's impact on the U.S. Supreme Court is going to be felt for a long time. It's interesting. One of the things that we may be coming at us uh, in 1932, you know, FDR won the presidency and he had a strong uh, Democratic majority in the in the Congress. And we all know that the New Deal uh, um, programs came from that. And yet within once FDR was reelected in 1936, soon thereafter, he uh, proposed a court packing plan because the uh, four horsemen, the old conservative guys on the uh, Supreme Court were striking down so much, were responsible for striking down so much of the New Deal. And so we know that the court packing plan didn't go any place. You know, Congress refused to do that. And it's up to Congress to make that kind of change. And yet uh, the four horsemen got the idea pretty quickly. They all um, retired in quick succession. And so, um, you know, that was to the, uh, to the uh, advantage of the Democrats. We may see something like that going forward in the next few years. If the Democrats get a few lucky bounces and play their cards right, they can hang on to the political branches nationally, the legislature and the executive for a while. And they're gonna need that, I think, to, uh, you know, to try to uh, get around the limitations of a very conservative Supreme Court. So a couple things about that. One is, uh, especially now with Amy Coney Barrett on the US Supreme Court, it is not at all inconceivable that Roe v. Wade, which has been there for almost 50 years, it's what they call a super precedent, uh, may get struck down, flatly struck down, you know? And we know how the, how the conservatives think about this, right? Not only does the word abortion not appear in the Constitution, even the word privacy does not appear in the Constitution. Now, I don't think that's the end of the discussion, but for a lot of them, it is. Anyway, if Roe gets struck down, it's not as though abortion rights are just gonna disappear in this country, right? It will devolve to the states. And a lot of people think that's where it should be anyway. Um, and clearly some states like California, one way or the other, either through state legislation or through the state Supreme Court interpreting a state constitution will protect abortion rights. Uh, but I think it's fair to say a lot of states will not uh, uh, protect abortion rights. So the question arises at that point, whether or not it's time for a federal uh, law, a federal statute protecting uh, to some extent the, uh, the right to get an abortion. We'll see, we'll see if the political will and the numbers are there. Uh, as a result of the Supreme Court having over the decades worked out so many different aspects of the abortion right, and it's a complex issue, um, maybe that would be an advantage that a, a resourceful Congress could, could use in drafting legislation that you know, uh, appropriately protects the right, but then also 
in some ways appropriately allows for some of the concerns of the other side. For example, maybe women should not have the right to get an abortion a week before they're due to give birth, you know? This would be a serious concern, and so, for some people. Anyway, um, so there's that. You know, I'll just conclude with the following. Uh, on the one hand, we had, as was mentioned, um, this, uh, this remarkable breakthrough that we now have not only the first female vice president, but the first black female pre uh, vice president. Uh, so that's quite something, and yet, Californians rejected Proposition 16, didn't they? So it's interesting how you know racial politics are still working themselves out in this country. And so uh, if you look, I, if you look at a map, or I saw a map of California related to Prop 16 in terms of how the different counties, a majority of the different counties in California, went on Proposition 16. Try to think of what that map looks like. You can probably figure out that it was a sea of red with two blue dots, one in the Bay Area, one in Los Angeles County. So for what it's worth, we should know that a majority, we already know a majority of uh, voters uh, voted to maintain Proposition 209, which is Article 1, Section 31 of the California Constitution, which bans discrimination in uh, public employment, public contracting, public university admission against any person based on race, gender, ethnicity, and so forth. 24 years later, a majority of California voters voted to keep that rule in place. So it's just an interesting contrast there that you got that. On the other hand, we made this breakthrough with Kamala Harris. So, um, so I'll leave it there. That's everything I got to say. My wife and I have a previous uh, engagement, so I'm going to take my leave. But it's great to see everybody. Go, Joe. All right. There. Thank you, Marty, for staying late. I appreciate it very much. You're welcome. Y'all take care. All right. Aaron? You can have the last formal word before we turn it to the viewers. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I've learned a lot um, from my colleagues uh, this afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to learn from you and, uh, and talk with you and your students, Joel. Um, I want to start with a brief story. Uh, this was uh, in The New Yorker. Uh, about a week ago. It was a, uh, by a journalist who had been attending Trump rallies. And uh, at a recent Trump rally, uh, he went up to uh, a Trump supporter who was uh, a white man. And uh, from the reporter's point of view, a, a scary looking uh, white man. And the, the white man, the Trump supporter started saying um, really, really terrible and frightening things uh, to the reporter, um, I, I'm going to swear um, just to just explain what was being said. But um, you fucking faggot! Like, get out of my face! You fucking fat! You know, super threatening, very, very, very aggressive. Um, and then this Trump supporter's girlfriend uh, came over, and this was someone who the reporter happened to know. And the girlfriend was like, "Hey, you know, Bob, that's you know, that's Joe. He's fine. Stop, stop bugging him." And the Trump reporter was like, "Oh, sorry about that." And um, uh, and just kind of uh, normalized and uh, became kind of what we'd consider, you know, relational and interactive. And a few moments later, even denied that he had threatened or or said uh, faggot to the the, the, the reporter. And um, it's really interesting to me to think about why Trump voters um, voted for Trump. Um, I don't think it really has anything to do with policy. Uh, Trump voters were happy to support Trump when he said he would expand health care and they thought that was true and they were happy to support him after it's clear it wasn't true. Uh, they were happy to support him when the economy was doing well. They were happy to support him when he'd lost more jobs than any president in modern American history. They were happy to support him before COVID. They were happy to support him after arguably more than 100,000 people died than would have died if the pandemic had been managed properly. Um, analysis of what Trump is about for Trump voters is that, is that for about 50 years, Republicans had motivated their voters to go to the polls by inciting resentment and scapegoating and, and, and hatreds and paranoia, uh, uh, you know, about black people or about immigrants, about Jews, about gays. The maneuver was pretty much always the same. The, the, the Republican leaders would tell their voters like, hey, this outgroup is worse than you, white person, and they are awful and you're better than they are. Um, and so we're gonna hate them together. They threaten us 
and you should support me, a uh, Republican leader. Um, and, uh, and I would argue that it didn't even matter um, who the scapegoat was in any particular election. Uh, sometimes uh, the emphasis was on undocumented. Um, looks like Aaron had some, oh, let's hope he can come back. Um, give it another try, Aaron. All right, we will, hopefully Aaron will come back and join us. Are we back? Uh, I can hear you. Joel? Yeah. Can you, can you hear now? Yes. You're loud and clear. Even if Hello? you don't see the picture, go ahead with the audio. Uh, 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 oh, whoops, whoops. Good. Now you need to unmute. I'm not sure whether the problem was on your end or my end, but if it was on my end, I'm so sorry. Uh, okay, no problem. No, so no, I do. Where to. you left off. Yeah. Um, so, so my analysis is that the the voters um, who the Republicans were inciting with scapegoating and demonizing and, and hatred didn't really care which particular scapegoat was targeted in any particular election, as long as someone was made into the scapegoat. And 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 the reason that that was so um, compelling to Republican voters. Um, is because it's empowering, is, is that they, they feel empowered when their leaders demonize outgroups, Black people, Latinos, gays, whoever, um, and, tell their, and tell their white followers that, um, that they're better than, than the outgroup. But part of what was complicated for, for Republican voters all this time is that Republican leaders were giving their followers a mixed message because at the same time that they were inciting these hatreds and resentments and paranoias, um, they were also acting at another level like moderate, tolerant, reasonable people. Um, and so they would use what are called dog whistle appeals and they would kind of subtly uh, uh, incite uh, racism just enough to show their voters um, that they were uh, along for the ride with this scapegoating maneuver. Um, but then they were also asking their voters to kind of not enact um, the paranoia and the resentment. And, and what I would argue what's so compelling about Trump to his followers is that he not only incites them to hate outgroups, um, uh, in particular undocumented undoc uh, uh, immigrants and black people, um, but he also invites them to be clear about that and to, and to not be in the closet about their, about their hatred. Um, and so that when he says that he could go on to, into the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and his followers would still like him, I would argue that's the reason why. Um, because unlike other Republicans, he doesn't force them to stay in the closet about um, the scapegoats. The question that we've been asking together in this seminar is why the election uh, uh, ended the way it did. And I don't quite think that's the right question. I think the question is why did the 70 million Trump voters um, vote for Trump? Um, it of course matters that we have a little bit of a timeout uh, with Biden, um, but Biden is not going to be able to restore democracy. And even if Biden is able to enact some important uh, executive orders uh, or pass some laws, um, stolen courts are going to are going to strike down those those orders and laws for the most part. Um, uh, when a party can't govern, even when it wins, that's that's not democracy. That's not not single part. That, 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 that's that, that's single party rule. That's that's not democracy. Um, even though Democrats can can still win elections, I, I would argue, consistent with Scott Siegel and Francis Neely, that the reason that Biden's victory doesn't really matter that that much, is because it didn't de-radicalize the Republican Party at all. And even electoral thrashings don't de-radicalize the Republican Party. The, the Republicans were thrashed in 92 and 06 and 08 and 18, and they became more radical after each thrashing. They even did an autopsy in 2012 
um, uh, in which they recommended to themselves that they become more moderate, and then uh, and then and then Trump became um, president one electoral um, cycle later, and and the reason Republican so 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 Republican. Republicans don't need to stay in power uh, to, to be in power to win. They can win slowly out of t uh, over time by uh, winning elections and ripping apart the welfare states and then losing elections but blocking Democrats from doing anything. Um, but the, the reason Republican radicalism, I would argue, is, is so dangerous um, is because the party is structurally committed to lying. I, I, don't, I don't believe that um, uh, as Scott Siegel proposed, there was kind of an, you know, there, there's really any division between kind of the economic wing of the party and the paranoid resentment wing of the party. I, I think what happens is that the capitalists, the wealthy donors, the corporations who want tax cuts for the rich, um, they incite paranoia to motivate uh, mostly white people to go to the polls and send them to Washington where they cut taxes and deregulate the economy. And, and neither part of that coalition uh, can tell the truth about what they stand for. The, 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 the capitalists can't tell the truth about what they stand for because cutting taxes on the rich is not popular. Um, and the resentment voters can't tell the truth about what they stand for um, because um, it's, it's so ugly. But there's no difference. In, in a way, Donald Trump is a gift because he's allowed people to see how the Republican Party works. But the Republican Party has been working like this um, for more than a generation. Um, uh, and you can see that uh, going back to uh, going back to Gingrich uh, in, in 1992, um, who worked very hard to get evidence um, out of policy. The reason lying is, uh, pr Professor uh, Timothy Snyder, a historian at Yale, says that once a political party is committed to lying, anything is hap anything is possible. And and the reason that the Republican Party's structural commitment to lying is so dangerous and really is not going away. And Joe Biden's not gonna be able to do anything about this. And even if Joe Biden had won, you know, 60-40 instead of 51-47, it, it wouldn't make a damn bit of difference. Um, um, it's so dangerous because you can now see what the Republicans are willing to lie about. Um, uh, so, so today, as some speakers have mentioned, they're lying about the legitimacy of the election. So that means that half of their followers now have no more faith um, in the legitimacy of American elections. Um, but what about when Kyle Rittenhouse um, assassinated two peacefully protesting um, black people and then uh, someone praised that and President Trump retweeted the praise for the assassin and no Republicans spoke up. Do we really think Republicans would tell the truth about tyranny about uh, genocide. I, I don't think that this party is willing to tell the truth or able to tell the truth about anything. Um, and what that means is that as we see the further erosion of democratic institutions over time, and as we transition into authoritarianism or tyranny, the Republican party is gonna be perfectly happy to preside over that um, and to not tell the truth about that and act as if, if everything um, is normal. And that's very, very dangerous. Um, and so, you know, of course, it's good that Trump is out of office because he's personally, his personality is reactive and that reactivity is dangerous. And but the fundamental dynamic of a Republican Party that is structurally committed to lying about anything um, and is radical, not just about policy positions, not just about its commitment to cheating, not just about the extremity with which it elevates partisan priorities over national interest, even inviting foreign enemies to interfere in our elections. Um, uh, none of this is, 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 is going away. And there's nothing that can be done about that at the ballot box, unfortunately. Um, and I, I fear that the one opportunity to diffuse this dynamic would have been if the, Repo if the Democrats had swept into power um, and passed legislation to unrig the system uh, but that's not going to happen now. So I'm afraid that um, that ship has sailed and I'm very pessimistic about the next steps. That's okay. It. Well, thank you for your incisive, if uh, not necessarily happy analysis. Um, we have uh, several questions, but I think one question that um, would be a good one to end on would be uh, comments about the congressional result. Um, as far as I heard, the la as of yesterday, 
no re sitting Republican House incumbent was defeated. Uh, you all who follow elections, when was the last time a losing party for the presidency did not lose a sitting House member? Uh, I, I, that seems totally wild. Um, and of course, we have the right now in limbo Senate. So who would like to make some comments about the congressional results? Go ahead, Jason. I mean, I think the Senate is, is it's, it's tough to beat incumbents. It's really tough to beat incumbents. Um, in Republican states, Republican incumbents are tough to beat. You know, um, I think the same thing is in the House. I, I think it's, um, you know, a lot of the Democratic seats, you know, the Democratic majority seats are in places that, you know, probably lean Republican and, and it can be hard to win in those. Um, I think in 2016, there was a huge turnout of voters, or 2020, a huge turnout of voters who were Republican Party voters uh, that didn't turn out in 2018, and, you know, and which is why the Democrats were able to take the House. Um, and I think that you saw a lot of split ticket voters. I, I do think you, I hate the idea. I don't like the idea of split ticket voters, but I think you saw in, in Senate races at least, and this is sort of that first point, you saw a lot of people voting for Joe Biden in Maine and, and Susan Collins, you know, and a lot of people maybe in Georgia and voting for, I, I mean, I think it's it's just really hard to beat an incumbent senator in when things are relatively okay in the economy um, in a Republican state, in a, in a red state. I mean, it's just really hard. That's what about the House, though, Jason? <laughs> I think I was surprised by that. Uh, again, I think it's there was just some of the some of the Republicans that won were in were in lean. Most of them were in lean Republican districts. I think I don't. I still think they have a, a Hillary Clinton district. It did one. I don't think any of the Republicans that survived were in you know Hillary Clinton district. Twenty sixteen Hillary Clinton districts. So these were lean Republican districts. This was high turnout on both sides. Close races. Incumbent Republicans. Um, in, in Republican leading districts are hard to beat and the economy in those places apparently didn't be perceived to be too bad. And um, the president's approval rating wasn't so bad amongst those. I mean, again, I think it's just, we're closely divided uh, on these types of elections and it can go either way. And it, there's not, you can't take a ton of, of explanation out of that except for incumbents can be really hard to beat in some, some elections. I think Anyone one of else? the things, one go of ahead. the things, I think one of the things we need to remember is Many of us who follow this stuff, our perception of the Democrats' chances going in were flavored by the bad polls, the polls that were wrong. And if you go back six months, nobody was talking about Iowa being a possibility for Biden as a presidential electors, you know, and as far as the electors go. And nobody was talking about the, the Senate going uh, to the Democrats, really. Those were really long shots. And it turns out that the, the uh, the polling got it off, and so our perceptions of how well the Democrats did versus that mistaken information, we need to adjust that if we want to understand uh, what really happened here. And uh, I'll just repeat what I said before. Clinton, uh, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, lost 10 seats in his first election and nine seats in, in the House of Representatives in the second election he won. So both times he won there, and this is fits right in with what Professor Balcom was saying about the Gingrich Revolution and, and the rise, or at least the more prominent uh, approach to, you know, uh, scorched earth policy and, and, and politics of resentment and hatred. So um, um, I'm not sure it's that out of the ordinary. Uh, and I don't know the answer to your question, of course, how many times that happened. We're talking about, I think, a loss of five seats, if I'm not mistaken, or that's the, the guess at this point. Let's Let me say something uh, about a, a later step. That is, let us, uh, if the Republicans retain control of the Senate, then, um, uh, you know, uh, the Biden uh, and, and Biden, and indeed all the bad stuff uh, about a coup doesn't happen, then, uh, you know, Biden takes office and um, he will then be forced to uh, in, rely increasingly on executive orders. Now, um, one of my uh, uh, friends from graduate school, Nancy Bermeo, 
uh, has uh, she uh, she's at Princeton and she um, wrote recently in Journal of Democracy an article on uh, creeping authoritarianism. And one of the things which she which was identified, I'm not sure if she was a sole author or not, but she was one of the authors. And one of the things identified in that article, which I hadn't seen before as a, as a variable, is um, expanding executive power. That, that uh, one of the things, you, know, you see this in Poland, uh, you see it elsewhere, that the judiciary is being weakened, the legislature is being weakened. Uh, it, it's happened in Turkey uh, where, where you get procedural changes to expand uh, executive power. Um, and to some extent, you know, I mean, we've, we've all been talking about the Republicans as dictators and, and indeed, uh, you know, uh, Obama did expand executive powers from what it previously was. And it, we may see more of that. And, and it's not really about, uh, it's not about the intention of establishing a long-term dictatorship as much as this perception that the opposition is just being unreasonable and inflicting great suffering on the people. So to rescue the people, executive powers must be enhanced. But what, what that leads us back to is that the institutional order that the United States has and has had uh, for two centuries is that the electorate, and, and that has never not been the whole people for, for most of, uh, of American history, but the electorate has to be clustered around the middle. Uh, you need a single peak at preferences to use a term from uh, public choice. Um, uh, that uh, the distribution of preferences need well, no, so not single peak of preferences, but uh, where the preferences are clustered around the middle, where the distribution is kind of bell shaped, and um, if you don't have, and right now what you have is uh, two humps. Uh, you have a cluster on the left and a cluster on the right, and few on the middle, and that is. Uh, that institutions are just not survivable, whether they're specific dictatorial intention or not. That if they're not survive, they're degraded. And um, I think uh, you know I, a lot of this discussion has been wa centered around uh, Washington and public opinion, but um, we've got to start asking different questions about why you're getting this dual clustering. Uh, part of it is race, uh, we, we've talked about it, but uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of traitor whites, as it were, uh, who are not going with the white majority. Uh, and um, uh, the, um, so uh, to understand how we're getting this clustering and if possible, to, to do something about it. Uh, are there, uh, you know, uh, I mean, most of us belong to the left cluster. And so I'll, I'll just take that for granted. And, uh, you know, then how do we induce defections from the right cluster in, into the middle to, uh, so that there is a disincentive from breaking institutional rules? Right now, there's no disincentive. The Republicans do not expect to lose any votes by denying the outcome of an election uh, by um, uh, playing along with uh, messing with the Pentagon and so on. Um, so uh, what the, what the cent uh, you know, single clustered uh, normal distribution type uh, distribution of public opinion does, it creates a disincentive from uh, deviating from institutions. But it, with two peaks, there, there are two clusters, there's no disincentive. Thank you very much, Sanjoy. I'm going to have to exercise my uh, authority looking at the clock. Um, I don't want to keep either our panelists or our viewers uh, beyond the time. Uh, so I want to thank everyone for their insights. Uh, this has been a fascinating, if um, disturbing election. Uh, and we will see how things go. I want to let everyone in the a viewing audience know next week we will assume a Biden uh, administration uh, and uh, ask the question uh, for what will a uh, Biden administration look like regarding domestic policy. 
and all of my colleagues who uh, work in the area of domestic policy uh, are certainly cordially invited to give their um, insights and comments on what a Biden administration would look like. And then the week that we return uh, after Thanksgiving break, um, I hope to have a wonderful IR panel and look at the Biden administration with regard to foreign affairs, personnel, policies, changes from the Trump administration of uh, policies and personnel. So those are our next two weeks. And then we will end with a topic uh, that a number of speakers have already referred to. What can you do now that the election is over? And how can you act to improve your community? And we will have members of the, um, and uh, Ron Hayduk mentioned this, the Office of um, uh, uh, Participation and Civic Engagement and in the Institute for Civic and Community Engagement, and maybe some faculty who work with students regarding internships. So that's the way we're gonna end the semester. Thank you all for logging on this week. I hope you found the analysis useful and um, in, in, insightful. And I look forward to seeing you next week. To the members of the panel, thank you so much for your time and creativity. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joel. Stay safe, stay strong. Take care. Sure.